Uh, welcome, uh, everybody, to uh, this plenary session, which will be slightly lower octane um, than uh, sessions that Lee organizes. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, very important and significant. Um, uh, and it's because we want to debate here um, some important concepts um, and, and potential ways of organizing our work at C4ICREF. And a revived concept of stewardship economy has been put forward as a new proposition under development that has great potential to address a current gap in our provision by Ravi Pravu, Steve Lowry, and John Colmey under the auspices of GLF. And many of you may have read um, the, the blog and, and seen uh, videos of, of, of Ravi talking about it. But this is yet to be discussed amongst scientists across the institution, all considered in juxtaposition to other holistic frameworks that are gaining traction within C4 ICRAF, such as agroecology. As you know, there is a successful TPP on agroecology that's given rise to um, a coalition to transform food systems through agroecology with approaching 100 members, including 33 countries, um, the European and African unions, and uh, over 60 organizations. So this session aims to debate the similarities and differences inherent in these approaches. Stewardship economy, like nature-based solutions, has an environmental pedigree focusing on the need to conserve, but recognizing that farmers and foresters are key actors that need to be part of the solution. And that's something that came out in the restoration session this morning and the Sahel Renaissance uh, uh, session also earlier today. Um, looking at how uh, these farmers and foresters become stewards of the environment. Agroecology, on the other hand, starts with farming and food production but tries to do that equitably and in harmony with nature. Now, on the surface, we might expect that these two strands will meet in the middle. In reality, perhaps the mindsets associated with initiatives coming from the conservation and agricultural traditions, respectively, are often fundamentally different. At the end of the session, we hope to have clarity on the similarities and differences offered by these approaches and how C4 ICRAF should embrace them as either complementary or competing paradigms. So I want to start with a poll. So um, uh, Fabio, can you um, uh, show us uh, how people can participate in the poll? I am not seeing the instructions yet. Well, the, what we're trying to do is to ascertain your level of understanding of each of these concepts. So please yeah. uh, join uh, slido.com uh, hash stewardship when, when you get in, uh, or you can scan uh, uh, the barcode if you're using a mobile phone. And... Um, what we're going to do is ask four questions of you. And the first is on a scale of one, nothing, to 10, all that there is to know, how much do you think you know about stewardship economy? Nothing is one, um, uh, uh, and 10 is... You, you, you're not going to learn anything from this session. <laughs> oh, nobody nobody wants to admit to being 10. Hey, Ravi, I hope you're doing this poll. And Steve, <laughs> if you don't know all there is to know, we're lost. I'm not going to influence the poll, um, <laughs> Fergus. Yes, good, 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 good idea. So, Fabio, can you see when the voting is dying down? Yeah, well, it's not I can. voting. Really. <clears throat> still coming in. Some votes are still coming in. 
Okay, it's stabilized. Okay, so uh, actually, this is very interesting because it shows that uh, you know uh, a lot of people are going to learn a lot in 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 the next um, uh, hour and a half. Fantastic. Um, let's move on to the second question, which is very um, uh, uh, clear. It's again on a scale of one irrelevant to 10 of central importance, how important do you think stewardship economy is for C4 ICRAF? If you don't know anything about it, then, then uh, you know, it, it, you, you decide how you want to school. I don't want to influence your, um, and in fact, um, yes, this is very interesting because we've now got uh, fewer people uh, down at one <laughs> and more people um, up at the top. So maybe people, even if they don't know about it, think, well, it must be important, which is, which is fair enough. And, and, and obviously a lot of people plumped for five right in the middle. That indicates they're sitting on the fence, folks. <clears throat> okay. Let's move on to the third question. And this is now going to uh, look at things from the agroecology perspective. On a scale of one nothing to 10, all there is to know, how much do you think you know about agroecology? Oh, I thought for a minute nobody was going to know anything. But now, uh huh. So we seem to have well, a lot of uh, the modal uh, 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 result seems to be seven. Or the, the yeah. Um, so, so people seem to know uh, quite a lot. Six, seven, eight seem to be very popular. Uh, um, five percent of people know nothing at all. That's quite worrying. We haven't been doing a very good job on communication in that case. Good. I think we can close yeah. the, the voting on 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 that one, and then we go again on a scale of one irrelevant to ten of central importance. How important do you think agroecology is for C4 ICRAF? For C4 ICRAF, how important is agroecology? Quite a few people think it's quite important. Seven, eight, nine, and 10, uh, getting quite a lot. Nobody said that it's completely irrelevant um, yet, but I don't want to goad anybody into doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, good. Okay, so we can probably um, uh, close uh, the voting on, on that poll. Um, and that, that's our baseline. I hope uh, Carl's in the room. Um, uh, uh, and we are going to have a poll uh, uh, at the end, not asking the same questions, uh, asking different ones. Um, uh, so uh, please be attentive so that you can answer those ones um, uh, intelligently um, at the end. Um, and without further ado, um, uh, let me invite Ravi Prabhu um, to uh, tell us what uh, stewardship economy is all about. Ravi. Um, thanks, Fergus, um, and thanks very much uh, for setting this up. Um, apologies to everybody um, for the lack of uh, a pretty presentation, but perhaps it uh, reflects accurately where we are in our thinking. So I'm going to speak today about stewardship economy, and in so doing, um, I'm going to try and touch uh, on some of the questions that were asked in the previous session about um, how do we get the kind of change at scale that we all need? Uh, recently in The Guardian, there was a rather alarmist uh, article which said that, uh, uh, this was about a week ago, so it's really quite recent, that uh, if we continue as we are in 10 years, we would lose the planet, whatever that meant. Uh, it was an article focusing on biodiversity. And I'm sure all of us agree that's not uh, what we want to do, not just as sort of human beings who live on this planet, but as uh, professionals who have um, spent, uh, you know, the better part or all of our careers trying to do um, something good. 
So this is a set of thoughts that a number of us have been having, um, and I want to acknowledge that um, these are not just uh, my thoughts. Can I have the next slide, please? Thinking about stewardship has gone back a long time. Um, and all of us who've been thinking about this do want to sort of tip our hat to um, uh, Aldo Leopold, who is probably one of the first modern uh, conservationists, if you like. And, and I've just taken three quotes of his, um, which deal with the whole issue of environment and stewardship, um, just, just um, um, to, to establish a baseline. He said uh, that the destruction of soil is the most fundamental kind of economic loss which the human race can suffer. And he went on to say, but if the soil is gone, the loss is absolute and irrevocable. I think we heard a lot about um, soil, both in the plenary and in the, in the parallel sessions before that. And I think all of us can agree with that. One of his other quotes, which I'm sort of putting together um, a little bit, uh, was that civilization is a state of mutual and interdependent cooperation between human animals, other animals, plants, and soils, which may be disrupted at any moment by the failure of uh, the way we interact with it. Again, not something that's surprising, but his work was from the early part of the uh, 20th century. So it's about, mm, 80 to 100 years um, ago that he wrote all of this. And he described a land ethic as a mode of guidance for meeting ecological situations that are so new or intricate or involve, involving such deferred reactions that the path of social expediency is not discernible to the average individual. So complexity, um, scientists talk about this um, uh, as cryptic information, things that are hidden um, and therefore um, not uh, you know obvious and and a lot of what what we're seeing in terms of degradation and the and climate change uh, is because of uh, uh, actions uh, our local actions not being obvious to us that um, they have um, larger consequences um, the butterfly effect if you will next slide please I also want to tip my hat to some economists because the, uh, it's the clues in the name, um, stewardship economy. Uh, so it was, I think, Marshall, um, one of the, I would say, grand grandfathers of modern economics, who first thought about the, the concept of negative externalities, but it was really, uh, or externalities as a whole. And it was really Pigou who developed uh, welfare economics, who took this and, um, developed the concept that we now know as negative ex externalities, which is now, you know, you've got pollution, polluter pays and all of those kinds of systems of um, um, taxation and sometimes of subsidies um, that allow us to think about um, human actions beyond uh, what is was happening in the market at the time um, and, and bring it into the economic sphere. So, there's a lot of thinking that has come from sort of different areas. Um, and we are trying to draw on that as we develop this concept of stewardship economy. Next slide, please. So I've tried to pull it all together here. And it, this, is, this is very much um, uh, notional. So in the center, in the, in the dark circle, you've got, as it were, the classic e economics of Adam Smith, Marshall, et cetera. Um, Keynes is somewhere there as well. Pigou added uh, welfare to this um, and stretched um, economics in that direction. Subsequently, a whole number of people um, have brought in uh, concepts of environmental econo ecological economics, uh, Bob Costanza being somebody who's, who's done quite a lot of work more recently. And, and the outer white circle is, is a notional circle where um, I think that you know, within the period where we might, as it were, lose the planet, uh, economics might still continue to grow towards. All of this is within a, a broader concept of commodification of nature and the importance of markets. So everything we deal with in, in economics today, uh, more or less, um, uh, lands on markets and some kind of a price on nature. So that's what I'm calling commodification. Notionally, there's a whole space outside of that, and all of us know it and we experience it, that are outside market systems, outside economic valuations that are still important um, for nature. 
um, and and survival and uh, thriving of uh, all species on this planet, but uh, focusing um, on human beings. So it's that uh, entire larger egg that we want to look at and see whether the concept of stewardship economics or stewardship economy as we are developing it can address everything, not just the white egg in the center, but the entire green plus white egg. So perhaps if I'd been a little bit smarter, I would have made the inner egg yellow, and then I would have had a perfect egg with egg white and yellow. Anyway, next slide, please. Stewardship as a concept is already among us. Uh, here are the logos of the Marine Stewardship Council, the Forest Stewardship Council that all of us know, um, the other one is something of st about stewardship in, in business, that's from Forbes. So it's not a new concept, although um, people have different definitions of it, they use it in different ways. Our definition, next please, is that it is a deliberate and informed combination of solic solicitude, foresight and skill, a marriage of practice and ethics, born of experience and embedded in culture, that has visible and tangible impacts on landscapes and at the for forest, farm, and community level. So it's a it's a larger concept which says, what is stewardship? It is you know a duty of care. Um, it's caring for nature, but it's also caring for society. So uh, that's that's how we think we are currently thinking of the concept of stewardship. But uh, uh, I appreciate that you know others may have varying uh, definitions of this, and there's many more than the the four uh, uh, that are implicit on this slide. Next slide, please. The, the stewardship economy, now bringing that term in, then therefore seeks to equitably reconcile the well-being. And sorry, uh, my, my dog wanted to have a say in this. And the welfare of stewards, who exercise a duty of care towards nature, with the health of nature using market and non-market partners. I'll come back to this. Um, uh, in a later slide. It recognizes that markets are neither intrinsically structured to ensure that a duty of care is exercised, nor do they assure equitable welfare outcomes. And these are sort of quotes from uh, various, uh, well, the two, uh, the blog and the paper that, that have appeared. I, I want to just uh, tarry a little bit on the two uh, images I've chosen to illustrate. So on the one hand, you have, uh, I believe from Mindanao, um, uh, or somewhere in the Philippines, uh, a rice terrace system that we recognize from many, many parts of the world. And it, the rice from that system costs as much as any rice um, that you go to a market. So in no way are the farmers and their forefathers uh, uh, and mothers being uh, rewarded uh, for the care that they've exercised in producing that rice. But what you see there is a manifestation of a duty of care towards the environment, uh, which is tr true of many, many traditional systems, because that was simply um, the best thing to do uh, to survive. And the other picture of the of the women going um, to collect water um, is th is the flip side of this: the fact that you know uh, traditional communities and many others, um, uh, even modern communities, uh, if you want to think about them, who are practicing. Uh, uh, region agriculture, organic agriculture, agroecology uh, agri in, in places are not uh, really uh, getting rewarded for doing uh, an ex exercise. So their welfare uh, is being ignored. So what we're saying with the stewardship economy is you've got to look at nature and a duty of care towards it, but we have a duty of care towards people, especially the stewards who are looking after nature. Can we look at the next slide, please? So in thinking about this, and I'll come back to some, some thoughts uh, in, in, a, in a while, um, we thought about what is the difference between what the market gives, and I've talked uh, in a paper about, uh, about the difference between a true and a fair price, um, and, and, and often pointing out that for, uh, for uh, essential commodities, you will never be able to get a true price in the market because that would be far too expensive for poor people, so we need to get to a fair price. So between this true or fair, fair price towards what uh, uh, what is actually needed for people to have uh, uh, the kind of well-being that would drive a different relationship with nature, something that came up uh, uh, quite a few times, I believe Rick and Al Kichu, some of the others in the, in the previous session had brought this up. Why do we still see degradation, especially at the local level? Well, the hypothesis here is that 
they are not being able to meet their well-being and welfare needs out of uh, the way they manage uh, 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 their, their agricultural and forest system, manage nature at the, at, the, at the moment. So if we can define a theoretical dividend that would get them to, to be able to, 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 uh, to manage nature better, um, we, we could possibly do this. And then uh, there are, you know, at the moment, three uh, uh, hypotheses. Uh, about how one might uh, develop this dividend. I don't want to go into this too much at this stage because um, this is just an introduction to the concept and many of these things will require a great deal more thought. But we need to take into account the needs and aspirations of the stewards. Uh, any economic value att attributed to non-commodified products and services. And here I think some of the, some of the kinds of things that Tor, Lee and others have been doing on ecosystem services um, and their monitoring outside of markets is really going to be important to inform people about the value of the services um, that are being delivered um, and, and rewards that might go towards them. And then the fair price of a commodity in the market. Uh, we don't want all, all farmers in the world to be producing vanilla simply because the price is high and they can make a good living out of it. We do need the rice, wheat, uh, uh, maize, but also coffee and tea to come out of it. And fair prices um, for all of those may still not give people the welfare benefits that they want and well-being that they deserve. Next slide, please. So um, basically, just pulling it all together, um, what we're talking about is this um, stewardship dividend um, that will recognize that there is uh, uh, there are people exercising a duty of care. We want to encourage more people to exercise this and be rewarded for it within markets through fair prices and um, outside market through transfers of some kind. And this starts getting very difficult. In a, in a paper that I recently I wrote in January, um, in a special issue of a journal here in India, uh, Kamal Bawa introduced the paper say, uh, or in, uh, briefly and then said to me, Ravi, I don't know whether there's much appetite in India for subsidies uh, at the moment. And the, and the problem is that we use these loaded terms. I agree, subsidies don't make sense. But what about rewards? If somebody is doing a good job, shouldn't they be rewarded? If as you're not rewarding them, you're not going to transfer any funds to them. So this is the question whether you know, about markets and their inability to reward, reward good behavior in most cases. Uh, just two thoughts here before I start wrapping up. Um, the current COVID crisis is costing uh, the world $9 trillion. So it's not about whether the money has been spent wisely or not, but a lot of that money was spent outside markets in order to keep economies afloat, for simply to keep economies afloat, but also to assure and ensure the well-being of people. This happened more in developed countries than it did in uh, countries under development, but that's just an indication. I was looking at some statistics here while India has been looking at a uni universal basic income, not something that we are, we are proposing, but it's a good indicator of the kind of uh, thing that we're talking about. Universal basic in, in, uh, income in India um, would cost roughly um, three, maybe four percent of GDP to get people up so that their well-being um, is is uh, is uh, is assured or better assured than it was. Now, if we think about those who are actually stewards, uh, it's a probably at the moment a subset, but we would want all our rural uh, communities to be up to that. So, four percent. The current cost of bad environmental practices of degradation to the, to the economy is uh, around 6% of GDP. Those kinds of transfers, however we structure them, would give us a 2% saving on GDP. I looked at the US um, and the, the, the universal basic in, uh, income that Young had, uh, had uh, proposed was uh, estimated to cost 2.8 trillion uh, per year, which was sort of working out um, uh, when they then they did their final sums of what they would take away, et cetera, uh, was roughly about the same, five to 6% of GDP. And the cost of air pollution alone in the US is 5% of GDP. So, I mean, these transfers could make sense, but the important point I want to make here is, first of all, the money could be saved. And secondly, 
the money is not going to be transferred through markets. Next slide. So uh, my last slide and bridging towards um, what Valentina is going to come uh, come back to. I've already uh, sort of introduced the uh, stewardship economy as an equitable system of exchange and who it deals with. What I want to stress here is, um, and it's you know the it would it would have surprised me if the the poll had been uh, different uh, because it's a set of propositions that seek an ethical and equitable pathway to economic, social, and ecological sustainability. It's a body of knowledge in early development that focuses principally on rewards, incentive, voice, rights, including tenure, and their recognition as 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 a part as a as a as a pathway to stewardship of nature. Our focus is on land, and agroecology is a set of principles and practices based in ecology that seek uh, sorry uh, that seek to sustainably and equitably harness productivity in agricultural landscapes. It is a more established body of knowledge, but it is um, uh, uh, something that, as I see it, uh, sits in a more technical um, uh, sphere of uh, dealing with agricultural landscapes. What the stewardship economy calls for is a paradigm change. With that, thank you, and back to you, Fergus. Thank you uh, very much, Ravi. Um, what we're going to do is have now uh, um, a few minutes for clarification questions on um, that presentation. So not big discursive uh, session. We're going to have a discussion later. But, but at this point, um, the idea is if there's anything that you'd like Ravi to clarify about um, the, the remarks that he's made on um, stewardship economy. And I can see Carl already has a, a, a question. Uh, please, in Bogor, if you have questions from that side, please do let me know. And Fabio, please uh, uh, send me a WhatsApp if there's things on the chat. Um, Carl. Thanks, Ravi. Really interesting stuff. I'm just, just so I can understand it a bit more, how do you relate this to payment for you know, ecosystem or environmental services, that literature and that work? Because it's, it's all about rewards. So just, just curious on your thoughts. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Carl. And it's one that we debated early on. Um, and I have to say, uh, and I should have said this um, uh, at the at the outset, um, um, we did look at the literature on PES, and I have to say that I have been in, uh, uh, quite quite uh, influenced by um, uh, writing and thinking that Mayner, uh, Sven, uh, Peter, and others have uh, on on PES systems. The, the 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 sense I got was the issue of scale. PES tends to tends to be projectized and localized, uh, and with the with the kind of uh, change that we need, the scale that we need, uh, it didn't seem to me that uh, the PES uh, uh, systems uh, with the high transactions costs could get to um, the kind of scale that we uh, we needed to, and they tended to be. Uh, as a quasi commodification, mostly of water, but sometimes of uh, others, not a general sense that uh, there's a functioning uh, natural system that has many, many dimensions, and we, we need to deal with those uh, dimensions. But there are definitely similarities. Um, and it draws a lot from um, both that literature and, and that thinking. Okay, and uh, um, Ramni? Yeah, um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ravi, uh, for this educational um, intro to stewardship economy. Um, I just wanted to know, um, and you didn't mention it, are there any other big players in, in the same domain where we are, forestry, agroforestry, agroecology, whatever, agriculture, are there other players in this who are taking stewardship economy forward or are we the pioneers, which would be wonderful too? Yeah, I think uh, so. Uh, I think the concept of stewardship has a lot of uh, traction, a lot of players using it, as I said, in different ways. The combination of stewardship and economy in the way we have used it is something that came out of discussions that, uh, you know, John, Steve, and I had, particularly with. Uh, uh, with a company and 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 this program that we've called Slingshot, um, where we got feedback from a number of uh, pretty eminent people 
uh, on these concepts. Uh, some of them investment bankers, some of them, um, I think, people who've been in the conservation business, and some of them very much in the uh, sort of agricultural research. So they, we were encouraged to think uh, of putting these ideas together. So in the sense of what we've presented, uh, this is very much a C4 ICRAF um, idea, and uh, maybe John uh, or would, will comment at a later stage. Uh, but the, the feedback we're getting uh, to this idea, there's a lot of interest. Uh, clearly, there's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but that's the whole point of being um, uh, a, a, a knowledge-based uh, institute that is trying to innovate uh, towards a better future. Yeah, and, and Mika has uh, 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 the last question uh, for now. You're going to speak in a minute. Thanks, Ravi. Um, I just had sort of two linked questions. I was wondering if you looked at the land care approach in Australia, particularly yeah. on the stewardship side, and some of the benefits that were noted to come out of that. And then also this, this assumption that if there's what you've called good behaviour, does that actually result in the type of savings on air pollution, etc., that are estimated? Is there enough evidence that if it's like, unless it's everybody in a community doing that good behavior, are we gonna see the economic benefits? So uh, thanks for that, um, uh, Mika. Uh, definitely, land care was a really important part of sort of my thinking on this. But I also want to acknowledge, uh, you know, uh, my interactions with Carol Koff on ACM and a number of other people um, related to, um, you know, these these kinds of issues, um, in especially in traditional societies who have managed. Uh, I mean, there there is. There is a strong sense that a lot of the forests and nature that we have is because those people wanted to keep it for whatever reasons and they exercised the duty of care. Land care basically, both in Australia and as it was taken to South and Southern Africa, um, uh, did focus on that uh, that uh, duty of care. And there's a, there's a huge literature on duty of care as well, which uh, informed this. It almost became the duty of care economy, except that uh, John said, that's not something I can ever, ever uh, pitch to anybody. So let's stick with uh, simple terms. So uh, uh, definitely. And the other part of your, 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 uh, your question is also very pertinent. Um, and this really is the essence of the landscape approach. Uh, when we first debated, uh, you know, uh, with Peter Holmgren and others, sort of what was then called the Landscapes Fund, uh, uh, there was a sense that, you know, we had to basically say, okay, you know, it is the entire landscape or you don't get the emergent properties you want. And even if there are free riders in that landscape, it is going to be for, um, you know, social fence fencing and the rules within that landscape for the people within that landscape to deal with, there was no way that you could do this on an individual by individual basis. And that really is what we are seeing, um, uh, you know, and the, the point early that uh, Aldo Leopold made, that because individuals' actions tend to be cryptic, but at, at a certain uh, level of aggregation, they start becoming visible. Uh, and so communities, landscapes, whatever the, uh, the organizing principles are of aggregation, uh, they will be different for different types of ecosystem services, obviously, but it is, you know, large, it is the, the, the area of scale is central to the stewardship economy, which is sort of my answer uh, also on, on PES. I, I don't think we can go one brick at a time any longer, and we've got to find a way of doing uh, what the industry does now in most, uh, most countries, that it's pre prefabricated houses that you do, you, you put up much, much quicker because you can't otherwise um, cope. Okay, thank you, uh, Ravi. Um, we're now, I'm, you know, obviously we've got more discussion coming up. So, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, already these questions and the answers uh, <laughs> lead to uh, more uh, discussion. But let's um, uh, now ask um, Valentina Rubiglio to um, uh, tell us uh, what she thinks agroecology is. <laughs> what I think. <laughs> So no, uh, we apply agroecology principle in our projects in uh, in Peru with farmers and 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 communities. So, what I think is that, uh, as it is defined, is is an integrate response to global challenges that focuses on food system transformation and that is based on the local application of uh, the famous 10 plus three uh, principles. 
And, uh, and these principles, uh, next one. So these principle are uh, um, next, maybe you can, yeah. Okay, so these principles are political, economic, social, cultural, and of course, also agricultural and environmental. So we have um, recycling, input reduction, soil health, animal health, biodiversity, synergy, economic diversification, co-creation of knowledge, social values and diets, fairness, connectivity, land and natural resource governance, and participation. So the idea is that the application of these principles can generate pathways for incremental transformation to more sustainable food systems, contributing to meet global challenges. So the entry point is food system and is agricultural production. It's, it's a clearly defined domain. Um, what is Key is that there is the recognition of the agencies of fam family farmers. So again, the, it's, it's made explicit, family farmers are at the center of that. And also consumers in terms of production and nutrition. The next, please. So when we look at, uh, at those principles and, and we look at how we could organize them, we could consider scales and we could consider, and we can consider targets. So uh, we have management principles that are the one in red that apply to agroecosystems and that apply at the field and at the farm level. And these are the red ones. So recycling, input reduction, soil health, animal health, and synergy. And then there are other principles that relate more to agencies that applied to farm or to households, families, and to actors along the food systems. And these are the ones in green. So economic diversification, co-creation of knowledge, social values and diet, fairness, connectivity, and participation. And last night when I was preparing the, the presentation, trying to anticipate a little bit the content of, uh, of Ravi's presentation, I thought, hey, but here there are also two kind of stewardship principles. One is biodiversity that says that uh, maintain and enhance diversity of species, function diversity and genetic resources and maintain biodiversity in the agroecosystem over time and space at field, farm and landscape scale that recognize a, a, a stewardship role. And also, um, and also in terms of uh, uh, land and natural resource governance. So recognize and support the need and interest of family farmers, smallholders and peasant food producers as sustainable managers and guardians of natural and genetic resources. But now what I was listening to, to, to Ravi, I think that we also could look at three other principles that refer uh, to the economic component of, uh, of, I mean, that refer to fairness. I understand that it goes beyond that, but we have these three other principles that are uh, fair, fairness, that is support dignified and robust livelihoods for all actors engaged in food system, especially small scale food producer based on fair trade, fair employment and fair treatment of intellectual property, ra property rights. Economic diversification, that is diversity on farm incomes by ensuring small scale farmers have greater financial independence. And also connectivity, that is ensure proximity and confidence between producer and consumer through promotion of fair and short distribution networks and by re-embedding food system into local economies. All that is, all those principles uh, apply to the mechanic of food system. They don't go beyond that. But still, I think that there are the key building blocks that correspond also to the stewardship 
idea and, and sense that uh, Ravi um, just presented. And I think that's, that's very important. Next, please. So agroecology has three manifestations. So there are like three big dimension. One relates to science. So it's the application of ecological concepts and principles to the design and management of food system. And so here we have ecology, agronomy, and environmental science. It applies to practices. So improve agricultural systems by harnessing natural processes, interaction and synergies among the component of the system. So here we have agroecological practices as an alternative to conventional agriculture. And it also relates to social movements that propose agroecology as a solution to modern crises through the transformation of agriculture. So these three dimensions are all interconnected. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's clear what is the role of uh, C4E craft in these three dimensions. Also, if we think at the presentation we had yesterday in the, in the opening session. Next, please. Uh, but as I said, um, most of the concepts apply to the agricultural landscape and the farmers are at the center of that. So what is relevant is that in the agricultural landscape, and that is, these are advancements that have been already made and recognized, is that it is possible to build alliances among big global communities working or engaged in the agroecology agenda, but also the ones who are engaged on ecosystem-based adaptation. Because uh, agroecology and uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity communities both work on a nature-based solution. There are some differences in the way in which things are defined, but they are similar. So. Alliances with ecosystem-based adaptation people and with nature-based solution people are possible. Uh, and, and building alliances is very strategic. So uh, also thinking at what we have been listening since yesterday, there are the, the uh, five big challenges. And, and my feeling is that we also have through the TPP or themes in c 4 craft, we also have communities, communities of restoration, community of agroecology, community, but actually we are all allied. So we really have to look at what is common because those synergies, I think, will are the ones that will allow us to uh, accelerate. And also because the challenges ahead are too big to be addressed by one single community. So we do not have, cannot have one single answer or one single approach. So uh, when, when we go to the communities and we start talking about agroecology principle, we realize that farmers get a lot of messages by other communities and that there is a lot of noise. And so farmers don't know, do they have to prune? Do they have to eliminate shade? Do they have to plant fast growing species to stock carbon? Or do they have to plant long-term species that are important for conservation? They, they are lost. Everyone land on their community with a solution and with funds to change their behavior or support a, a transformation, transformational change at their level. So we really need to build this synergy uh, to minimize trade-offs and reduce this noise. That is, it is really damaging the, the entire process. And also because investment on processes at the middle level, and here by middle level can be jurisdiction, and we know that we have jurisdiction that are nested into each other. Landscape can be watershed. It doesn't matter, it's landscape. Uh, the, uh, we need to, I mean, what is the enabling context for that is, is has the same building blocks. If you don't have rights to trees, you don't have rights to carbon. So all these things are connected and, and interrelated. So, and 
what we are talking about are sustainable land management practices. That can be for mitigation, that can be for adaptation. It depends of what, what is the target or what is the problematic you have to address, the more urgent needs that have to be addressed in the landscape where you operate. Next, please. So when we look at forest landscape, then it's, it's slightly different because in forest landscape, and there are two interesting publications by Peter Newton about who are forest people, forest dependent people, or people who live proximate to forests. We have a range of livelihood strategies that relate to forest. There is a dependence on forest, can be from forest services, can be from products, can be from, I depend on the conversion of land forest because I'm a farmer. But there is a gradient of, of dependency and relationship that uh, it's important to take into account. So we do not have only farmers. And that's very important. We also uh, meet different types of institution. So the forest sector is a particular, forest and, and conservation sector are two big particular groups that is very difficult to, to, to work with, especially if we come from a more um, agricultural, sustainable agricultural perspective. But also we have very strong and really eradicated customary institution that are sometimes, um, that are very important to understand, but that are, uh, I mean, it, it, it's challenging sometimes to, to get that, to get the right way to operate and interact and understand how to, um, engage in a transformational process with, uh, with them. And then we have the global community. Uh, we have jurisdictional level. We have conflicts between the agricultural and the forest sector. As, as an example in Peru, we have institutions who want to work on agro-territorial zoning and they are not entering into the forest land that is legally classified as forest land, but it, it is where the coffee is produced because they are not allowed to um, intervene on the forest land because there you have the forest uh, sector institution that are, and the conservation institution that they, they don't accept explicitly that you have agriculture on forest land. So uh, my idea is that we have complementary principles to be developed to integrate the forest and the farm component and, and promote the sustainable management of land and forest resources. And uh, I think that this is key and that is probably something that uh, strongly relates to what we are going to discuss in the, in the coming half an hour or... Yeah, indeed, uh, 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Good. Um, so, so uh, again, just for the next five minutes, uh, um, clarification questions. So, again, not, not the big discursive ones, but clarification questions on uh, what Valentina has said. And Ramney is, is hot off the blocks. Yeah, thank you, Valentina. That was very nice. And I've been wanting to, haven't had time to read about agroecology. But if some, very quickly, if someone was to ask me, what's the difference between agroforestry and agroecology? What would I say to them, please? That, uh, my goodness, I have to get it right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So if you, if you read the agroecology literature, agroforestry is a practice under the agroecological practices. And uh, not all the agroforestry follows the agroecological principles. So it's not intrinsically or by default part of agroecology. It depends on how do you design your agroforestry intervention using the uh, agroecological principle. So it's, it's part of the big families of, of uh, agroecological practices, 
if you apply the principles of agroecology to design the intervention and also to implement all the rest of uh, um, components that are part of the of the principle in your project or in your intervention. So, I... yeah, I would also say, um, Ramni, that there is a session in the World Congress on Agroforestry in Quebec in July, specifically on the linkages between agroforestry and agroecology. Um, so that might be it's the closing plenary of of that congress so so that will be explored in in quite a bit of detail uh, there uh rick no no yeah kind of a, cl a clarification question i mean it it seems to me that that if you look at principles of agroecology there isn't really a future for any food and agriculture system that doesn't conform to those principles. On the other hand, there are all sorts of uh, problems at all sorts of scales. I'm thinking of the way we started out this meeting yesterday with these global challenges that current sets of agroecology principles don't address. And so we've got in agroecology, it seems we've got we've got principles for our common sustainable future, sort of partial, but very, very incomplete. The, my, my incompleteness hypothesis of, of agroecology. And I'm wondering if two things now, one, you know, can we make agroecology and the principles that define agroecology more complete? Um, uh, and you've you've suggested that in terms of bringing forestry into the picture, I wonder if there are if there are further areas that we could add principles for that would make agroecology more complete. And since the presentation on stewardship economy, I'm wondering whether that is one of the pieces that fits in. I liked your your connection to stewardship um, in your in one of your slides there, um, but there were. Things that Ravi was talking about, which were not yet connected. So uh, the question is: Can we extend the concept of agroecology, probably through additional principles? Because the definition of agroecology, in terms of principles, is very powerful. Can we extend its definition to to increase the connection with these other sectors that are so important? Good clarification. <laughs> I, I can uh, start answering. Um, I think that it is really important to, to do so. Uh, and it's not only about forest. My concern is that when you then think at your audience, I'm thinking at national level, Policymaker and sectors, agroecology is under agriculture. And so you can make it perfect, but still it is under one sector because it's, it's, so I don't know what is, I mean, how can we expand that scope and also, uh, change the way in which ag then agroecology is perceived as something that is much more uh, comprehensive than uh, improving uh, the way in which you produce and your all the changes along the, the, the food system. Because that's still, it has a very clear niche. Like now in Peru, you have the vice minister of blah, 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 blah and agroecologia. But if you look at the policies and the thing that they change is all related to food. And we are struggling to get them integrating agroforestry into that because they say, no, that's forestry. So I think we have to also to understand how then you translate these things in like and, 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 and to your target audience and what do they have? Who are they and what, how do they find things? Because we can have very strong concepts, but when, if they do not really fit to current reality, 
then we cannot accelerate change because we are not talking the same language. So okay. we need to, I mean, we, we sh think it's important to discuss about I, I'll, I'll, how to I'll, be clever. Yeah, I'll bring Peter in later because I think we're getting into more than clarification here. Um, uh, 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 let let let, let uh, uh, um, uh, John Colmy would like to just say a couple of words before I ask Steve. Um, John wanted to explain um, why uh, GLF are interested in in stewardship. John. John. Um, first of all, thank you, Fergus. This has been a fantastic session, um, and and the whole week has been great. I just want to say a little bit. And I'm going to quote Robert the other day on our question on integrated land management. Uh, the landscape approach, uh, the whole world, and all of our charter members, which are a lot of big institutions, have adapted it. But how do you implement it? That's been the issue, and it's very frustrating for a lot of people, but in a lot of organizations. Stewardship economy may be one way to do that. And I emphasize may. Because, and something's happened in the world. The world has changed. At C4, I spent 10 years building it. We built this program, but we could never get information in. It was always broadcasting out. With GLF, information is pouring in what's happening in the world. Feedback from ever. What's changed? Black Lives Matter, climate justice, decolonization. You know, the whole shift in this way, 1.7 billion committed at the COP for indigenous areas. When we did the GLF in 219 on rights, it was the only conference we ever had that lost money. Everything has changed now. And this stewardship economy may be the way forward. But one thing at GLF that is not going to change, and by the way, we are science-led, and this is beautiful because this is an example of how science leads GLF. This is led by you guys. But what, what isn't going to change is the, and GLF is now shifting very quickly, with the charter members, everyone wants on board on this, is to shift to a focus on stewards in the landscape. The landscapes in which we're intervening, we're gonna focus now on the people that are using those areas and working with them. Uh, that's not gonna change. And last thing is donors love this concept, by the way, we presented it to 25 foundations and every single one says, we wanna know more. We want you to keep going on this. And I think this is a great study. Steve uh, and Ravi are the minds behind this. So I look forward to seeing Steve's presentation. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're now having had a look at, at, at both these concepts. Uh, uh, we now want to sort of reflect a little bit on on uh, on them. Um, uh, uh, with uh, firstly with with Steve uh, Lowry. Steve, thanks, thanks, Fergus, and. Uh... It's uh, wonderful to be in Bogor uh, with our colleagues here after some time being away and uh, to be uh, participating in this, in this event. I'm, I'm really delighted. And so I'm meant to speak briefly on uh, a little more deeply. We're getting some static here. Can you everyone hear me clearly? Okay. Um, on uh, so to, a, to maybe a, a fuller definition, of what's meant by stewardship in the context of, uh, of some of the debates that we're having. Fergus at the outset characterized uh, stewardship, among other things, as uh, treating farmers and communities uh, as part of the solution. And of course, that's precisely what we're talking about, but we're, we're also sort of could argue uh, that they are the solution uh, ultimate, ultimately, uh, and they're certainly central to the, to the solution. Uh, stewards, uh, of course, we think of in, in that respect as uh, land users, the people who break the ground, uh, who make the decisions about uh, when to plant, what to plant, uh, how to fertilize, how to cultivate, how to conserve soils, how to manage forests. And it's their decisions that they're making multiple decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that together constitute are sort of uh, the outcomes uh, uh, with respect to uh, land use globally. There's a whole uh, set of institutions that can be directed toward uh, helping them be better stewards uh, or institutions that by virtue of their logic can make life more difficult for them. And this is, these are the points that, that Ravi made when talking about 
so stewardship versus the external costs they're not that are not traditionally sufficiently compensated for. Uh, but I want to focus on the steward and how we understand them and make some arguments about their centrality, that is the land users as stewards, to our, our research agenda. And so let's go to the next slide. Uh, so we had a definition, Robbie presented a definition that John and he and I sort of put together from uh, uh, different uh, scholars' perspectives, uh, including Aldo Leopold. I'm drawing here, I'm building on that, and everything I'm going to say is consistent with those principles. Uh, but I'm drawing on a very useful paper by West et al. from 2018, where they sort of characterize good stewardship uh, practice uh, around three principles. The first is care. And care can be understood as the embrace by farmers and community members of attitudes and values that motivate them to apply sustainable land use practices. Care is the ethical core of stewardship. It is a sense of duty. Robbie has speaking, spoken to this, shared widely that compels people to look after the natural, natural environment on which they depend. Uh, we look after the environment, the environment will look after us. Uh, next slide, please. Knowledge is central. And we talk about the knowledge that we provide as, as research institutions, but it's the knowledge of the stewards that's vital to the, you know, that guides them in making decisions uh, about the best kinds of stewardship uh, outcomes. Knowledge is the information and know-how that informs stewardship action and includes knowledge about ecological, social, and governance processes. Care, our first principle, emerges from directly managing social ecological relations and requires an understanding of interspecies and dependencies. So we can think of stewards as managers of social ecological systems, and they are. They deal with obviously the environment and they deal with the, the great variety of social, political, economic, and, and other institutions that affect, delimit, or give opportunity to decisions that they make. Care is embedded and practical, and this kind of experiential knowledge is not, by definition, easily achievable by non-residents. This is sort of a, a crude knowledge passed on from parent to child, uh, intuitive, uh, calibrated, engaged to uh, what's going on in the environment. Uh, and, and, and once again, it's you know, managing a complex system that's both uh, social and ecological in character. Next slide. Sorry, I'm rushing here, but agency, we've heard agency, I've been delighted to hear agency repeated on a number of occasions yesterday and today, including in Valentina's talk. Agency denotes the abilities and cap capacities of individuals and groups to take action. Exercising agency largely depends upon possessing rights to land and other natural resources. If you have rights, you can do things. If you don't, you can't. You know, you can't organize, you can't act, or your, your, act, your ability to act is very severely uh, limited. Stewardship for Aldo Leopold is a form of democratic action in support of sustainable land use outcomes, outcomes that are mutually beneficial to human society and natural systems. This is drawn from a 1942 essay called Land Use and Democracy. Without agency, democratic action is not possible. Next, next slide. So these are the three sort of constituent elements. And care, knowledge, and agency should be thought of as mutually constitutive, each supporting the other, like the inner way one strands of a rope. And the, you know, if one is not present, the others cannot be made manifest. Farmers and communities manage land and resources directly. Governments don't and typically can't. This is a very important point that Leopold made in his essay, Land Use and Democracy. Stewardship is embedded in existing values and attitudes and is not easily created and in settings where it is not present. A culture of stewardship can be weakened where agency is lost or local, social, and economic systems are disrupted. And we have evidence of that having happened with the kinds of outcomes suggested here around the world. How do people lose agency? Their rights are taken away. They lost rights in the colonial era. Uh, rights to forests were not returned to communities after independence and so on and so forth. 
Uh, okay, so governments, what can they do? Well, they do what they can do, which is to establish reserves, protected areas, and attempt to regulate land and forest use. Hence the, the quick reversion to, we have a biodiversity concern, let's establish a reserve uh, or a protected area. And with consequences, obviously, to uh, local people who might live here. By the way, uh, Ravi made a precedent of explaining or referring to the photograph. And this is sort of just by sheer sort of chance, GLF did a great job of putting together these photos, but I was present when that photograph was taken in Southern Nepal and the Terai. Uh, when visiting with colleagues, a, uh, a, a community uh, forest uh, association that had been given rights to a forest through Nepal's very significant and important forest rights devolution program. And uh, what these women are doing is harvesting lemongrass from the forest. And on, on this site, in this forest, is a distillery that distilled the lemongrass into essential oils that were being sold, sold through supply chains globally. And one of the women said to me, before we had rights, I was just a wife. Now I am somebody. Okay. So this speaks to what? This speaks to agency. Okay, you have rights to make decisions on how this land is used and how the products of that land are sold and marketed. Governments constructively can and do support research. This refers to Leopold in that essay. What can governments do? Well, they can support research. Okay. But re the research agenda often consider the presence or absence, often don't consider the presence or absence of local conditions conducive to good stewardship. I'm, I'm speaking here contemporaneously. Today, this is sometimes the case. Researchers evaluate how interventions framed by norms, goals, and measurable standards set by governments, donors, and scientists might promote desired outcomes. And I'm offering this as criticism. Okay. If you wanna focus on the goals and aspirations, constraints, opportunities of the stewards, you've gotta put your feet in the shoes of the stewards and not assume that, you know, ideas coming from European capitals are the right ideas, or that they re reflect the, uh, the understanding of the context in which stewards are making these complicated decisions, these social ecological decisions on a daily basis. Hence, interventions reflect a limited understanding of local context. I've just spoken. Next slide, please. We're almost done. Socio ecological systems. Theory. Is this the last one, Steve? Sorry? Sorry? Is that the last slide? This is the Steve? last slide, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Socio ecological systems theory provides a framework for understanding and evaluating the origins and presence of stewardship practices. This is not a new line of work, but there's a couple of interesting new journals uh, that are publishing work on socio ecological systems theory that draws from Leopold and others who have worked in this division. Um, and I think I'll just, uh, maybe just the last point for Leopold, human and natural communities were intimately intermingled. Our social, economic, and political realities did not and could not exist in an ecological vacuum or conservation challenges it followed could not be addressed apart from the social sphere. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Oh, there's an, a lot of people resonating with what you're saying there. Um, uh, and and uh, Lalisa, are you online? Yes, Fergus. Would you like to um, uh, give your reflections and then we'll open up for discussion? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my mine will be very brief. Um, uh, I don't think I'll do justice if I have to talk about the similarities and differences. But uh, let me just try to highlight some points which I thought are really critical in my view. In my view, the first one is: I mean, when we think about the stewardship economy, as indicated before, it's really critical to know what reward could actually drive a change process within the localities or within the landscapes that we are dealing with 
and who determines what level of reward is required and who pays for it and who governs the whole system of that reward mechanism. Because our experience from the payment for ecosystem services for water, biodiversity, carbon, and all of these things shows the drive is there, but the commitment to pay for what is really due to be paid is not there. We know the difference between the social cost of carbon and the actual cost of carbon on the global uh, market system. The second point is uh, more really related to both the stewardship economy and the agroecology. It is about the people's view. Now we are talking as experts sitting here, but what do the people living in those landscapes we have in mind think about this whole structure? And I think there is one good point which was raised in the uh, stewardship economy, which is the landscape democracy. Of course, that's a very critical point because people have choices, people have preferences, people have rights to different forms of intervention that they think is appropriate in their own scale, despite the level of knowledge they have on how they should be managing their own landscapes. When we think about democracy, of course, it's a relative term. There is no true democracy. It's all about A is better than B in XYZ or B is better than C in KML and all those things. But we should not have also forget the values of traditional or indigenous democratic systems that promote sustainable natural resource management because at the bottom of both the agroecology and the stewardship economy, it's about better management of the ecosystems and nature. And we should really make emphasis on those points and there should be a room for those issues. And my third point will be more looking at the power of partnerships and collaborations to manage leakage that happen at different scales. Uh, if we don't pull together different institutions, different sectors, different ministries, as rightly Valentina was mentioning before, I think we are still creating leakage that could damage the ecosystem that we ought to have preserved better by driving the mechanisms that we think are more effective. Uh, this is really still critical because the issue of institutions, the issues of governance should be at the center of all these discussions, whether we are thinking from the agroecology point of view, which is more of a practice principle, or whether it is from the stewardship economy points of view. And the last one is really more about looking inward. Because I was just listening from the beginning up to now, and yes we are generating the knowledge we are generating the innovative tools mechanisms but where are we in this big picture of the issues that we are talking about i and you where are we within this whole implementation that we think should drive the change that the planet right now needs in conclusion i think stewardship is really about every one of us making our best effort to make sure that the planet can be saved from the crisis we are facing. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, Lalisa. Um, uh, um, I'm going to take questions in a minute, but there are a couple from the um, uh, uh, web that, that, that I want to, uh, uh, one to Valentina and, and one to uh, Ravi or, or Steve. Valentina, uh, Anya Gassner is very insistent. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, that um, uh, you address this question, which is she has a PhD in agroecology. And when she did her PhD, agroecology was simply the ecology, the functioning of the agroecosystem. Are we not in danger of overloading the term? So, she has a PhD in agroecology. Uh, uh, Who has a PhD in agroecology? Uh, Anya Gassner says she has. <laughs> so she, Anya, has. Yes. Uh, Anya has a PhD in agroecology. Have. Okay, have Valentina. Uh, uh, Anya, ask the question. <laughs> I do have, and I asked the question. I followed up with a second question, and you, I mean, we've been working on this long enough. We are up against 40 years of extension service thinking of linear agricultural practices. 
we are arguing that agroforestry is actually a circular system supporting the ecological functioning of agroecosystem. It's one of our strongest arguments at the moment. So it's super important that we have a clear communication on agroecology because it has gotten lost. So my question back to you and Fergus is, since it is so relevant for us, are we not in danger of overloading the term and maybe missing the key message that we need to actually give? Thanks. Um, yes, I think that there is this risk. I think that, uh, again, what Laliza said is super relevant is to whom are we talking? Because we, we as researchers can overload the term. There, there are no risk. We can, we, we can do that. But then if we think at the institution and the partners we are interacting with, and, and where do we want to generate change? We have to be very careful in not uh, overloading these terms and really understand where do we need to generate, generate change with which type of, uh, of concepts. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I think you. it may be worth taking on, on board the fact that the evolution of agroecology uh, to encompass the more social and um, governance dimensions, I think came about because people trying to uh, focus on agroecological practice didn't get very far because you can't do things when you've got a, an enabling, a, a disabling environment that prevents you from making the change. So if you want an agroecological transformation, it has to take on board the governance and the social issues. So no, it's not overloading. It's minimum necessary in order to make, to, to, to make change. I, that, that would be the way I would look at it. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, just one clarification for, for Steve or, or, or Ravi um, is how does uh, their uh, uh, idea of stewardship economy um, relate to uh, Julian Pratt, um, um, you know, who uses the same label and has stewardshipeconomy.org. Um, so if we Google it, you know, that's what tends to come up. He's got a very specific sort of uh, view of taxation. Um, and I just wonder what's the juxtaposition of, of the C4 ICRAF approach and how do we navigate the fact that there are some other, you know, very big, um, uh, ideas out there uh, uh, that use the same label. I don't know. I can give you. Like to... I can give you. I can have a first go, and maybe Steve can then correct me. Um, so, j just just for historical perspective, I mean, we did discuss um, this, and our, our ideas are so very different from Julian Pratt's. Um, but and and our path to the term was an entirely different one to Julian Pratt's. That I think. Uh, uh, you know, there is no, there, there can be no confusion with the, the sets of ideas that we are proposing and what he proposed. Um, that was our conclusion, and then we decided to move forward with this. Uh, just as a just as a comparison, um, uh, North Korea also calls itself a democracy, um, and and so 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 does um, um, uh, Sweden. Both uh, um, have uh, social socialistic uh, tendencies. But there is no comparison uh, uh, in their use of, the, uh, uh, of that term as well. So I think you know um, the, 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 these terms can can live in parallel. We are not uh, talking about land stewardship in the kind kind of ownership uh, tradition that Julian Pratt is talking about. Um, we just haven't addressed that. Perhaps at some later stage, uh, uh, there may be a reason to look at uh, why there are overlaps. That would be my answer. Um, I, I, I merely think that because the two terms have been put together does not mean that, uh, you know, um, that uh, we are in conflict in any way. Okay. Uh, Lee has a question. And then Anne Larson. And uh, Fergus, just to try and draw attention, there are some people online with their hands up for some time. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can, uh, I can see that. We'll, we'll bring you in, Andrew. But after the two women, okay? Yeah, sure. Thanks. No problem. 
Okay, great. I'll keep it short. So I have a question about in the term stewardship. And if you think that this will help in terms of scaling the whole stewardship economy. And of course, we often use the term soil stewardship. I can also let you know that I started the soil stewards program in 2003 um, in Idaho, the first organic farm in Idaho, um, still going, I checked online. So we're very, in the soil science community, we often use this because it really puts people at the center of taking care of the soil. And so I was wondering if with the stewardship economy, if you think it will also be helpful in terms of really empowering empowering people to take um, control to, you know, whether it's agroecology or agroforestry to really scale these approaches. Thanks. Uh, let's take uh, several questions and then um, we'll, we'll uh, allow people to comment. Uh, Anne. Thanks. So I think this whole concept is really exciting um, and has an enormous potential. I do have, I think, some of the similar comments as Lalisa in terms of the it becomes very, very local, very, very fast. And yet everything people local, local people do is influenced by so many other things. And of course, big drivers of change are not necessarily happening because of local people. So that's a whole piece there. And one of the things that I've, I've been thinking about recently, we, and in the thinking about land tenure and rights and all of these other issues that we work on is, are we fundamentally also talking about a massive agrarian reform, a new phase of agrarian reform, because right now land concentration is at the worst it's been in modern history. Um, I don't know if people have seen the uneven ground report that International Land Coalition um, put out last year. Uh, just one sentence here, today it's estimated there are approximately 608 million farms in the world. Most are still family farms but the largest 1% of farms operate more than 70% of the world's farmland and are integrated into the corporate food system while 80% are small holdings of less than two hectares. So land concentration is just getting worse and worse and worse. So we're talking about fewer and fewer of these stewards. And that seems to me sort of a starting point that needs to be part of the solution. Okay, um, uh, and Andrew. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Fergus. No, Fergus, it probably won't come as a surprise to many of you that I want to try and uh, address my long-standing lament that within the CGIR system, we do so little historical research or where we extend our timelines and uh, seize the opportunities that historical evidence, and there's plenty of it, can be used to better understand uh, and learn lessons from the past. And I raised this in, the, in the, the chat box as well, because I think one of the key questions, and it's interesting that both Ravi and Steve have cited Aldo Leopold, but neither of them actually referred to the Dust Bowl experience in North America, which was probably one of the most devastating uh, agrarian related uh, land degradation events that has uh, affected North America. And there's plenty of texts that have been written about that. Um, and my question was, with the historical evidence, it actually helps us identify what have been the triggers over time that have led to some of the alternative agriculture movements that have occurred mul on multiple occasions. And I refer to the work of Joan Thirsk, who unfortunately is no longer with us. She died uh, a couple of years ago. And her wonderful book, uh, Alternative Agriculture, that, where she traces alternative agriculture regimes over six centuries of British agriculture. And one of her basic tenets in her book is that it was very often uh, associated with major upheavals, including the Black Death. Um, and I think one of the interesting features of this current interest in stewardship economy and agroecology is, is it not perhaps linked to also the COVID-19 outbreak? It would fit very much within the theories that uh, John Thursk advanced. But I think most importantly, I think the historical evidence can actually help us identify solutions to current problems, which can still be found in the hard-won evidence of people living in the past. So my question is, why do we not use the historical evidence that is out there? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And, and we'll leave that question hanging in the air 
Um, uh, 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 we uh, and we'll go now to the closing poll. Um, I don't want to try to um, uh, uh, get anybody to um, uh, sum up. You can all be doing some of the summing up by answering um, uh, the, the, these uh, questions. Um, Fabio, do you have the closing poll? So here you go. On a scale from one not changed to 10 completely transformed, how would you describe your understanding of stewardship economy and agroecology now as opposed to at the beginning of this session? So how transformative has this session been for you? Ah, interesting. Uh, so for some people, it's made no difference at all. But thankfully, there's a lot more in the um, uh, uh, the other side, although quite a, uh, no, it, it, it seems to be that the longer we go on, the worse it looks. <laughs> <laughs> but, but of course, the, 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 the modal one there at, at, at eight is pretty encouraging. Okay, good. I think I think that's uh, uh, that's good. Okay, the second uh, question is on a scale from one completely different to ten essentially the same. How similar or different do you think stewardship economy and agroecology are? So, if they're completely different, then you're down at at, at, at one, um, uh, and if they're essentially the same, you're up at ten. Are they similar or different? Now, this is really interesting because we've clearly got quite a, a, a difference of opinion on. Um, uh, I wonder whether we were all in the same session. Although I see we do have this interesting situation of the modal one being sitting on the fence at five. We need another session. Uh, well, I think th th this is the beginning rather than the end, isn't it, of uh, um, what we need to... Okay, I think the voting's finished there. That, that is that is a, almost a normal distribution, I guess, Rick. No, he's got too, too much in the, in the middle. Okay, let's uh, uh, close the voting on that one and come to our last uh, question. And this one could be the most exciting of all. On a scale from one incompatible to 10 complementary, how compatible do you think stewardship economy and agroecology are as concepts? <laughs> and uh, it looks as though uh, a lot of people are very polite and want them to be complementary, uh, although not everybody. Well, that's in, so. So you know, on the whole, um, there there appears to be a general feeling. There's nothing below five. So uh, the people really think there is there is quite a high degree of complementarity, which which is quite interesting for us because that means that we probably do need to articulate quite clearly um, what that complementarity is, so that our messaging um, is you know is clear. Okay, folks, it is one o'clock here in Nairobi. So I'd like to thank everybody for what I think was a stimulating um, debate. Um, uh, as I say, lower octane than what we had um, but, uh, uh, before uh, coffee, but um, uh, I think really trying to explore in a bit of detail, I think um, concepts which are really, really important and not just the concepts, but how do we put them into practice and, and, and what that means for us as an institution? So thank you very much, everybody um, um, who has taken part. And um, I'll end the session uh, and hand over to the people in Nairobi and Bogor um, who are talking about um, the housekeeping issues. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>